Today we're in chapter 28. We're going to look at Sidon first. It's found here in verses 20 through 26 in chapter 28 of Ezekiel. Then we'll move into chapter 29 and look at the prophecy that God gave to Ezekiel concerning the nation of Egypt. So let's begin reading in Ezekiel 28 at verse 20. I'll read to verse uh, 24 and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 28 beginning at verse 20 reading to verse 24. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Sidon and prophesy against her and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Sidon. I will be glorified in your midst, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I execute judgments in her and am hollowed in her. For I will send pestilence upon her and blood in her streets. The wounded shall be judged in her midst by the sword against her on every side. Then they shall know that I am the Lord, and there shall no longer be a pricking briar or a painful thorn for the house of Israel from among all who are around them who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord God." Now, as we've been looking at some of the judgments in the last few chapters, we've seen that God has given a word of judgment against various places like Ammon and, and Moab, against uh, Edom and Philistia, as well as Tyre. And so, as we continue here in chapter 28, Ezekiel is bringing forth prophecies of judgment, coming judgment in this section, and he's speaking against Sidon. Now, when you... When you hear the name Sidon, you might want to picture, if you're able in your mind, to think in terms of the Middle Eastern geography. And if you picture the nation of Israel, just go north, and what you have is modern Lebanon. And so, Tyre and Sidon were two seaport cities. And uh, Sidon was 23 miles up the coast to the north of the city of Tyre. And so, this is the city that is being spoken of here in chapter 28 when there's a prophecy, prophecy against it. Now, early in the history of Israel, Sidon had been a great influence over the, uh, the people of Israel. They had influenced them towards idolatry. If you were to look in the book of Judges in chapter 10 at verse 6, and, and Judges, this particular section, chapter 10, was written probably around 1,100 or so years before Christ, so it's a few hundred years uh, before Ezekiel was written. If you look in Judges chapter 10, verse 6, it says there that the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve Him. And so, early in their history, they had been influenced by Sidon and Sidon's idolatry. And for centuries... This particular city and its practice of idolatry has been an evil influence in the life of the nation of Israel. And that's why God is saying, I'm going to bring judgment against you. Prophesy against her, he says, and, thus, and say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Sidon. I'll be glorified in your midst. They shall know that I am the Lord when I execute judgments in her and am hollowed in her. And then he says in verse 23, I will send pestilence upon her and blood in her streets. The wounded shall be judged in her midst by the sword against her on every side, and then they shall know that I am the Lord. So what happens is when Babylon comes and, and destroys Tyre, it also destroyed Sidon. Notice how the destruction is pictured. It's pictured as blood and pestilence. Those are two things that combine whenever there's battles because battles and sieges have a tendency of producing disease. And so this is what's going to take place. Destruction, and destruction is pictured as blood and pestilence. In verse 24, when it says, uh, there shall no longer be a pricking briar or a painful thorn for the house of Israel, the evil of Sidon had been a source of wounds for the nation of Israel. And so when she's judged, her evil influence and the pain that she causes will be done away with. Now, she's not completely wiped out, by the way, Ultimately, she will once again exist as a city. Now, as he continues, he says in verse 25, Thus says the Lord God, When I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered, 
and am hollowed in them in the sight of the Gentiles, then they will dwell in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob, and they will dwell safely there, build houses and plant vineyards. Yes, they will dwell securely when I execute judgments on all those around them who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God. I want to develop this. This is going to be something we spend a few minutes on. I want to develop this with you for a little while here because I think it's important enough to do that. What this is speaking of in verses 25 and 26 is yet future. This is something that is actually beyond the time of Ezekiel. We know that as Ezekiel is writing that the nation of Israel is in Babylon. It's in exile there in the nation of Babylon. But her time is limited in Babylon. We know that God in, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25, verse 11, says that they're going to be there for 70 years. And so ultimately that 70 years of captivity comes to an end. And a remnant returns to the land of Israel in order to once again live there and to do work such as rebuilding the temple. They did return, and they returned safely. But the safety that they dwelt in was not permanent. We know that just by looking at, at the history of Israel that, that they've been invaded and occupied many, many times. But God is making a promise here. He's saying that in their future, they will have peace. He's saying in their future, he will regather them and restore them. That's what he's saying in verse 25, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered. Now, it's not just their return from Babylon, but this is something that goes beyond the time that they return from Babylon. This is something that un under Jesus is going to actually be completely fulfilled when Jesus the Messiah begins to rule and reign. Under the Lord, they will dwell in security. Under the Lord, they will once again worship God. God will bring Israel back. The people will live in peace. But this is speaking of something that is going to be fulfilled in their yet distant future. Recently, some of you were with me on Sunday nights. We spent time looking at, at Haggai. And when you look at the book of Haggai, as I was pointing out, in, in that particular book, the prophet rebuked the people because the people had returned to do a work uh, of reconstruction on the temple. And as they had initially come, they had begun to do the initial work. And as they began to look at the construction, those who were old enough to remember the uh, glory of the temple as it was before it had been destroyed, those who saw the beauty of that temple were actually weeping so loudly that it was just something that was quite obvious that they were in great pain. There were some who were rejoicing, but there were others there who were weeping, and the loudness of the rejoicing and the loudness of the weeping was so combined that you couldn't tell if they were happy or sad. God begins to speak to them, and he he says, there are some of you who were here who remember the glory of the, of the temple under Solomon, how Solomon had built a beautiful temple, and the temple that you were used to was the temple that Solomon had built. An incredible, an incredible temple that was of unbelievable value. And as you're looking at it right now, you're thinking that it's something that can't be duplicated. And what happens as you look at the book of Haggai is they just stop doing the work. They get overwhelmed because of of uh, various things, and, and they, for 16 years, just stopped working on that temple. And so what happens is Haggai has to bring a word to them to say to them, you need to get busy working on this temple once again. Now, a contemporary of Haggai was a prophet by the name of Zechariah. Zechariah also wrote concerning this, but his message was intended to encourage the people in their unfinished responsibility. So in, instead of directing their attention to what they had failed to do, Zechariah shows them the future, and he reminds them of the importance of that temple. They're not simply building a building. Zechariah made it very clear to them that they were building the future, and their work on its reconstruction was an evidence of their faith in the promises of God. Because as they were rebuilding that temple, Zechariah was letting them know, you're actually building for your future. Because one day, Messiah is going to enter that temple, and he's going to do so when he comes to bring salvation. 
He's the one who one day is going to enter into the city as the humble king, which, which happens. And so Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 prophesied and, and says, uh, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so what they were doing is they were building a temple that one day Messiah Jesus, when he came in on Palm Sunday, was going to be able to enter into. And that's why he was saying, you're building for your future. As you're working on this, you may not see it in your lifetime, but as you're building on this, you're building for the future. You're building for the time when the Messiah who enters into Jerusalem will actually walk into there and will actually minister in that temple. And so... Working for God is always with the future in mind. Always is. And I was just talking to somebody just a little while ago, and I said to them, said to them this. I said, you just never know what God wants to do. So don't, don't put the lid on him. You just never know what the Lord wants to do. So don't hold him back. Just be open to what God wants to do. And Because, you know, we have a tendency of looking at the right here and the right now, and, and, and things sometimes can seem so overwhelming. We think, how can we get out of this, and how is it going to work? And, and there's just no way. The more I think about it, the more I realize that, that, that there's no way that what we're trying to do is going to be accomplished. And, and, and I had to learn a long time ago, and I relearned this as a minister all the time. I, I, I learned this as a husband. I learned this as a, as a parent. I, I will learn this as a grandparent. That, that just give God some time. He can do some unbelievable things. Like it's been said, next time you have a problem, give that problem at least three days because that's how long Jesus was in the grave. And the third day he came to life and at least give your problems three days because God can do wonderful things within a short period of time. Just always keep that in mind. And, and we have to keep the future in mind. We have to realize that the things you're doing right now aren't just for you. The things that you're doing right now are for the future generation should the Lord tarry. And, and that's what Zechariah, Zechariah was telling him. He was saying, listen, the work that you're doing isn't just for you. The work that you're doing is, is going to be something that is so extraordinary because you see, uh, your king is coming to you and he's bringing salvation. And when Jesus entered in riding on that donkey, the, the colt, the foal of a donkey, he was fulfilling Zechariah's promise to these people in the future. Not only was the Messiah going to enter in, but still in the future, there is a final regathering of the nation that will take place. Now, Zechariah, which was written about 520 to 470 B.C., in Zechariah chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. I will bring them back, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people. I will be their God in truth and righteousness. When God says that he's going to save, I will save my people from the land, he's saying I'm going to regather my people from their exile and their bondage everywhere. That has to speak of the last days because the Jews were not dispersed to the west until Rome did that. This has to speak of the last days. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 37, a chapter that we'll get to in about two years, in Ezekiel 37, verses 21 through 23, we read, Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations wherever they have gone and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king over them. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people and I will be their God." So that's what he's saying in verse 25 here in Ezekiel chapter 28 when he says, I have, when I have gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered. 
He's, going to, he's speaking of a future event that takes place as God is regathering that nation. We'll see that again in chapter 37. Now notice what he says in verse 26, how he says, They will dwell safely there, build houses, plant vineyards. They will dwell securely when I execute judgments on all those around them who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God. This is what occurs when Jesus, our Messiah, ultimately rules and reigns. Again, Zechariah chapter 8, verses 3 through 5 says, Thus says the Lord, I'll return to Zion, dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with his staff in his hand, because of great age. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Isaiah chapter 35, 10 prophesies, the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. When Messiah rules and reigns, it's going to be a time of joy and peace and security. And the old people will once again be able to sit outside and, and enjoy a nice, cool evening. And, and the children will be playing and, and there'll be peace and security because Messiah is ruling. And that's the picture he's giving to us. Now, it's interesting in verse 26 how he says, they shall know that I am the Lord their God. They're going to know this as the Lord executes judgment on those who have oppressed them. Their oppressors also will know that he is God, but the believers will know that he is their God. Now, at that time, multitudes of Gentiles will make spiritual pilgrimages to Jerusalem. Again in Zechariah 8.22, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. It's not going to be a center of the Jewish religion, Judaism. It's going to be the center of worship for Messiah. And as Isaiah 2 says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills. All nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And so he's speaking of that time of the regathering when from the west and the east all are re returning they're purged. They ultimately will worship Jesus, who is Messiah. They shall know, he says, that I am the Lord their God. Now in chapter 29, a prophecy against Egypt. In the tenth year, in the tenth month, on the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Pharaoh, king of Egypt, O great monster who lies in the midst of his rivers, who has said, My river is my own. I have made it for myself. But I will put hooks in your jaws and cause the fish of your rivers to stick to your scales. I will bring you up out of the midst of your rivers, and all the fish in your rivers will stick to your scales. This is a nice cheery little prophecy. This interestingly, and I want you to see it, just, it'll just take a moment to notice this verse 1 here, in the 10th year, in the 10th month, in the 12th day of the month. This actually takes, time, uh, takes uh, place sometime later. Now, this is the first of seven prophecies against the nation of Egypt. And this prophecy is looking forward when Babylon actually conquers Egypt. That's going to take place 17 years later. And he says in verses 3 and 4 that uh, God is against. He says, I am against you, O Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Notice how he's portrayed as a great monster. I'm against you, O great monster. This great monster is, is a picture of a crocodile. This crocodile is there in the Nile River, and it's acting as if it's in total ownership. It's in control of everything. Notice how he says, it is my river. But God says, no, I'm going to judge you. It's not your river, and I'm going to judge you as well as everything within the river. He's saying, I'm going to judge you as well as a fish. So when he says that to Pharaoh, he's saying, Pharaoh, I'm going to judge you, but I'm also going to judge all Egypt alongside of you. 
That's what it means when it says, all the fish in your rivers will stick to your scales. I'm going to judge you, you great monster, but I'm also going to judge everybody alongside of you. Verse 5, I will leave you in the wilderness, you and all the fish of your rivers. When he speaks of the fish of your rivers, this is the canals and the streams there on the Nile. You shall fall on the open field. You shall not be picked up or gathered. I have given you as food to the beasts of the field and to the birds of the heaven. Well, because you are uh, uh, an animal that dwells in water, you're not really one that dwells in deserts. What's going to happen is I'm going to deal with you and I'm going to leave you in that wilderness. You won't survive in the desert. And so what this is is a picture of judgment because any such animal will die in a desert and ultimately, like God is saying, you're going to become food for the beasts that actually live there in the desert. He says in verse 6, when, then all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I'm the Lord because they've been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. When they took hold of you with the hand, you broke and tore all their shoulders. When they leaned on you, you broke and made all their backs quiver. God is revealing something to them. When he says in verse 6, and I want you to notice this, all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord. What do you think he's saying? What he's saying there is this. You need to remember all the way back when Moses was there delivering the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage how that God brought ten plagues on that nation. And remember, the last plague was when God slew all the firstborn, from the household of Pharaoh to the household of, of, of slaves. Uh, they all, the firstborn, were killed. Why was that significant? Because when you read concerning the judgments that God brought on the nation of Egypt, each one of those judgments of plagues was against a specific God that was worshipped by the Egyptians. Pharaoh was looked at as being deity. He was looked at as being a god. And so Pharaoh has claimed to be God. He is saying that he created that river. He says that he controls the river Nile. The river Nile was the river that was used for irrigation. The river Nile was what Egypt owed its existence to. And so Pharaoh claimed that he was the owner of it. He was the one who masters it. And that's what God is saying. He's saying, you're claiming to be God. But in reality, there's only one God, and you're not it. It's like what Isaiah says in Isaiah 44, verse 6, where it says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Or Isaiah 46, verse 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is no other. I am God. There is none like me. Israel had options to look for deliverance. Israel could look to God for deliverance or Israel could look to Egypt. The problem is, is Israel had been looking to Egypt for their salvation. It's, re it's recorded in, in, uh, in, in the Bible how that king Zedekiah looked to the Pharaoh. His name was Hophra. Uh, how he had looked to the Pharaoh Hophra for help against the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. And at, at first, the Egyptians did cause the Babylonians to withdraw, but, but their presence was only capable of causing the Babylonians to withdraw temporarily. It, it says in Jeremiah 37, 5 through 8, Pharaoh's army came up from Egypt. When the Chaldeans who were besieging Jerusalem heard news of them, they departed from Jerusalem. Then the word of the Lord came to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus you shall say to the king of Judah, who sent you to me to inquire of me, Behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come up to help you, will return to Egypt, to their own land. And the Chaldeans shall come back and fight against this city and take it and burn it with fire. And so that's why he says that they are simply a broken reed. They're a broken reed that's going to pierce the hand of Israel because this reed, when you put your weight on it so it will sustain you, it actually snaps under your weight. It can't do anything other than harm you. So he says in verse 8, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Surely I will bring a sword upon you and cut off from you man and beast. The land of Egypt shall become desolate and waste. Then they will know that I am the Lord, because he said, The river is mine, I have made it. Indeed, therefore, I'm against you and against your river, rivers, and, and 
I will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate from Migdal to Syene, as far as the border of Ethiopia. Neither foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast pass through it. It shall be uninhabited forty years. I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and among the cities that are laid waste, her city shall be desolate forty years. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. Nebuchadnezzar's armies will come against Egypt. Pharaoh will be defeated. His defeat is total. The reason is ungodly pride. God says, I'm against you, and I'm going to make your land desolate. From the northern border to the southern border, it will all be desolate. Babylon did come. Babylon did defeat Egypt in 586, or rather 568. Egypt languished under Cyrus and then until Cyrus gained control of Persia. So what he's saying is Egypt is going to be dominated for an extended period of time. Now, when he says in verse 12, I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and among the cities that are laid waste, her city shall be desolate 40 years. There was a historian, a Babylonian priest, who wrote that Babylon took Egyptians captive and others had fled to neighboring cities. So that was fulfilled. Verse 13, yet, thus says the Lord God, at the end of 40 years, I will gather the Egyptians from the peoples among whom they were scattered. I will bring back the captives of Egypt, cause them to return to the land of Pathros, which is southern Egypt, to the land of their origin, and there they shall be a lowly kingdom. It shall be the lowliest of kingdoms. It shall never again exalt itself above the nations, for I will diminish them so that they will not rule over the nations anymore. No longer shall it be the confidence of the house of Israel, but will remind them of their iniquity, iniquity when they turn to follow them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord God. Egypt was restored, but it never did reach its heights that it once had enjoyed. But with the demotion, according to verse 16, Israel never looked again to them for any kind of help. Now in verse 17, it came to pass in the 27th year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to labor strenuously against Tyre. Every head was made bald, every shoulder rubbed raw, yet neither he nor his army received wages from Tyre for the labor which they expended on it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, surely I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall take away her wealth, carry off her spoil, remove her pillage, and that will be the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor, because they worked for me, says the Lord God. In that day, I will cause the horn of the house of Israel to spring forth, and I will open your mouth to speak in their midst. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Seventeen years later, 571, 570 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar had laid siege for 13 years. As, and this is interesting, in verse 18, son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to labor strenuously against Tyre. Notice how it says, every head was made bald. Now, what in the world did that mean? And I was thinking about that. And so, um, this is interesting what happened. When they were laying siege to Tyre, the people of Tyre, because Tyre was a very, very wealthy city, as we saw earlier, the people of Tyre took their wealth and distributed it. They took it out of the, out of the city. A lot of their wealth was placed on an island that is off the, the mainland there, and... Nebuchadnezzar's soldiers couldn't get to them. They had no access to this particular island, just a few miles off the coast. So you know what Nebuchadnezzar's army did is they began to pick up debris, heavy rocks and things, all the debris, and they were putting it on their heads or they were putting it on their shoulders. And they would walk out into the water and they would drop it. 
So that's the picture of what the Lord is giving here when he says every head was made bald. Because as they had the rocks on their heads, it actually was rubbing the hair right off of their head because they were constantly doing this and did this for some time, trying to in some way uh, fill up that strait between the mainland and that island. And so their hair was rubbed off their head as well as their shoulders became raw from carrying all of those stones. And so as this was taking place, they never really were able to succeed in getting to that island. And so as a result of that, what happened is because Tyre shipped out her treasures, Babylon didn't get her wealth. And so what they did is they took the wealth of the Egyptians. That's what it's saying in verse 19. I will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall take away her wealth, carry off her spoil, and remove her pillage, and that will be the wages for his army. They didn't get the, the wealth from Tyre, but they did get the wealth from Egypt. And God says that's going to be uh, their wages for working for him. In verse 20, I've given him the land of Egypt for his labor because they worked for me. They actually did the work of judgment on God's behalf. So God used Babylon to deal with Egypt, and Egypt paid the labor fees. Now, as this is part of the prophecy, we'll close with verse 21 when it says, In that day I will cause the horn of the house of Israel to spring forth, and I will open your mouth to speak in their midst. They shall know that I am the Lord. Israel will once again, he says, begin to blossom. Now I want to spend a couple moments looking at a practical application here. Egypt to Israel is referred to as a broken staff. They've been a staff of reed. He says, when they took hold of you with the hand, you broke and tore all their shoulders. Israel was a broken reed. Rather, Egypt was a broken reed to, eat, uh, to Israel. Anytime you look for something outside of God for support, anytime you put your weight, your full trust in something other than God, do not be surprised when it breaks under your weight. When I was a, a, a younger, younger man, from my early teen years into early adulthood, especially prior to coming to Christ, I believed that if I found the right girl, that my crazy life could be better. What it was going to require was the right girl. And so much of my pursuit was to find help and hope in, in a young woman. And the uh, problem is, is that whenever you put your full hope that somebody, some human being, is going to be able to bear your weight as well as their own, well, let's face it, we can only carry our own weight. We can help to support somebody else on occasion. I mean, we do bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Yeah, we, we are here for one another, and that's what the body of Christ is all about. But the bottom line is, is I only have enough faith for my own life. I don't have enough faith for everybody else's. You know, when Marie and I got together, I, I said to her, I can only believe for me. I don't have enough faith for both of us. You've got to have your own walk with God. I encourage you to know the Lord. I encourage you to be in His Word. I encourage you to be in prayer. I encourage you to take the things that God gives to you and, and to use them and build up your faith in Christ because I cannot believe for both you and me. I can't believe for my children. I, can't, I, can only, I only have enough for me. And that's not sufficient half the time. So I'm always calling on God for help. Lord, help me. Strengthen me. When you make, when you make that mistake of thinking that that a human being is going to be the person that you can depend on, fully trust. That is a major mistake. Even believers are going to fail you. Even those who don't want to fail you, do the best that they can, will eventually fail. I fail people all the time. I have people who have left this church over the years who have been disappointed in me, and, and I don't blame them because I can fail. I do fail. You know, I, I understand that. 
Anytime you put all of your hope and trust in a system, anytime you put all your hope and trust in a person, anytime you do that, you're making a mistake. The nation of Israel put their trust in Egypt, and God said they are a broken reed. On one occasion, it's recorded in 2 Kings chapter 18. It was said to Israel, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed Egypt on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust in him. That is the result. It is always a result when you trust in man instead of trusting in God. It's not that you don't love people and it doesn't mean that you don't trust them. I trust people, but I know what's in people. I know that they're not ultimately perfect. I'm not perfect, neither are they. So there has to be something greater that I put my full confidence in and it has to be the Lord. And that's where people make the mistakes. You have to put all of your trust in the Lord. You have to. I was talking to somebody a few years ago and they said, oh, I used to go to this church, but but I got hurt there. And I said, so join the crowd. You know, all of us have been part of a church that we've been hurt of in. All of us have. All of us have. This church began because I was hurt in another church. I was an assistant pastor. I was serving on staff. I was told by the senior pastor, you're not called by God. You're not a pastor. I was hurt. I was hurt in that church. But that doesn't mean I stopped going to church. That means I trusted in the Lord. I said, you know what? And I told them when they, when they said that to me in that board meeting, and they said, you know what, David? We're removing you. You're not a pastor. We're removing you from being a pastor in this church. Um, you know, you're not a pastor. You're a counselor. You ought to go back to school and, and finish your degree in counseling. And, and I, I looked at this board, and I said to the senior pastor, there's one thing I know, and that is this. I'm called to be a pastor, but I also know it's not here. <laughs> so I resigned. So I resigned. And that's how this church began. I said, you know what? I'm not giving up on God. I'm not giving up on church. I simply know the Lord is moving me someplace else. I'm going to trust in Him. I don't trust in man. Man can let you down. The ones you love the most can let you down. Every married person in this room knows that. The person you love the most can hurt you the most. The one you trust the most can damage you the most. The one you trust the most has the most power in your life and sometimes uses it incorrectly. We know that. That's why we love God with all of our heart and all of our strength and all of our mind because he never lets you down because God never abandons you because he never fails you because he's always with you. He doesn't reject you. He understands you. He holds you. He even has your tears in a bottle when you cry out. He collects them. He's aware of them. And that's why I trust in the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't trust my wife. Of course I do. She's listening to this message. <laughs> of course I do. But ultimate faith is not put in man. Ultimate faith is not put in a system. Ultimate faith is put in God through Jesus Christ. He supports you. He will support you, and he always will. The best thing that you can do is put your full weight on the rock, Jesus himself. The Bible tells us in Psalm 55, verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. So you cast your cares on him. You put your full trust in him, not in Calvary Chapel not in Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, not in Pastor David Rosales, but in Jesus Christ, in the Lord, because the Lord will sustain you. I've said this before, it's the truth. As much as I as a pastor would love to be able to carry the burdens with you, I simply am not available, but I know somebody who is, Jesus Christ. 
Have you ever called the Lord and gotten a busy signal? I never have. Have you ever called the Lord and, and gotten, uh, you know, an answering service? Hi, this is Michael. I'm taking messages for Jesus. I don't think so. You know, I go directly to him. I don't have to go through any checks. I don't have to go through any kinds of, any kinds of um, you know, inspections, you know. Yeah, the bottom line is, is that he's, he, he's the one that I, he's my Savior. I trust in him. He knows me, and I, and I know him, and, and that's all it takes. And, and so I can come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain help in my time of need because of him. And see, the problem with, with Israel is they trusted in man. They trusted in Egypt. If we trust in Egypt, Egypt will defend us against Babylon, but Babylon is going to come and take you no matter what, and Egypt won't help you, God says. And so what you need is you need to trust in me because God is the one who actually has a relationship with the nation of Israel. Now, Egypt, as well as Sidon, Egypt is where Israel actually learned idolatry. It was in Egypt while they were in captivity that they actually learned the ways of the Egyptians. It was after their deliverance as they were leaving and, and, and Moses was receiving the, the law from God when the people of Israel said, we don't know where Moses is and, and for all we know, he's dead somewhere. He went up on a mountain. We haven't seen him. We need a God that we can follow. You remember the story. So they said, give, give us a God. And so what does he do? I'll bring all your gold and and he puts it into a, 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 a pot and he, he melts it and they create this, this golden calf. And, and here comes Moses from the mountain and he, he sees the people rising and dancing and they're, they're in a, an orgy. And, and, and he goes to his brother Aaron and he says, what is it that the people are doing? And, and Aaron's busted and he looks at, at his brother Moses and he says, uh, he said, I don't know. He said, we threw this gold in this and this calf came out. You know, he's making this, this lousy excuse. And what happens is they had learned idolatry in the nation of Egypt. And, and that's why God said, I don't want you to go back to Egypt. Don't be going back to Egypt. It's a picture of the world in the New Testament going back to the world. Why do you go back to those things? Why do you go back to the alcohol that you used to use to, to help you in your time of trouble? Why do you go back to those drugs? Why do you go back to those old friends? Why do you go back to that old relationship? Why do you go back to that way of thinking? Get away from it because I delivered you from it and yet you return constantly. It's a broken reed. It'll snap off in your hand. It'll pierce you and it's going to wound you for life. Get away from it. Because when you have a relationship with God, God will never wound you. He actually was wounded for you. He was pierced for us. By his stripes we are healed. Jesus Christ took that for us. And so what do we do? What's the wisest thing we can do? The wisest thing we can do is say, not me but you, Lord. I will follow you. No, I'm not going to trust in man or the hand of flesh. I'm going to come to you and I'm going to ask you to provide for me. Jesus, you said it. You will give me my daily bread. I'm trusting you for that. I'm not asking you for weekly anymore or monthly anymore. I'm not asking for yearly. I'm asking for daily. Will you take care of me today? Will you care for me today, Lord? And guess what? God says, absolutely. I'll take care of you today. And guess what? It's always today. Because when you wake up tomorrow, it's really today, isn't it? Because it's always today. It's always today. And so, Lord, will you take care of me today? And the Lord says, absolutely. I will give you your daily bread. I'll take care of you every day, every moment. And not only will I care for you every day and every moment, but I'm going to usher you into my presence, into heaven, where there'll never be sorrow, never be tears, never be want, never be pain, never be sad memories, never be failure, nothing like that. It's all swallowed up. And what you end up with is joy and peace, and love, goodness, mercy, kindness, fellowship, relationships that you've always wanted. So, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Trust him. Trust the Lord, Jesus. Cast your cares on him, and God will lift you up. God will sustain you. When you trust in anything other than the Lord, it will always let you down. I've been following the Lord for 38, 39 years in December, and I can tell you, he never lets you down. He never lets you down. There are times that I've wondered, what are you doing? 
like Jeremiah, I've said, Lord, I'd like to speak to you about your judgments. I, I would definitely like to converse with you about some things if you don't mind, because it certainly looks unfair the way you're handling this. You see, Lord, if I were in control, that guy who bothered me just now, he'd be dead. <laughs> and I just don't know why you let him live. God has a way. God has a way. Cast your cares on him. He'll sustain you. I know there are some people right now who need to hear that. You need to know that. You need to, you need to leave this place today knowing that you can trust God. The enemy whispers in your ear constantly and says he doesn't care. The enemy whispers in your ear constantly saying, you are a loser, you cannot win, there's absolutely no way anything's going to turn out good. And all you need to do is tell him he's a liar because God's plans for me are good. It's been said because sometimes we, we deal with our past. Sometimes we can't even get past our past. But it's been rightly said, when the devil reminds me of my past, I remind him of his future. And when you understand what the Lord is doing, he'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. And so cast your cares on him and trust him. God's plans are great, and they haven't yet unfolded. And you watch what God does in your life when you trust him.